Kneel before Zor! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing Student Bodies, released August 7th, 1981. It was written and directed by Mickey Rose, with uncredited direction from Michael Ritchie, and released by Paramount Pictures. This film really only came to be because studios were looking for lower-budget, non-union projects to distribute during the writer's strike in late 1980. Because of Michael Ritchie's involvement, Paramount agreed to pay $1.5 million to acquire the film and put it in 600 theaters where it just barely paid for itself, but not enough to cover the distro costs. Ritchie was so disappointed in the final cut that his producerial efforts are credited to Alan Smithy. It's always a good sign when you're watching those credits and Alan Smithy's name comes up, right? <laughs> good old Alan Smithy. I've always wondered, why don't they just not put a name? I think it's a stamp of disapproval. Yeah, essentially okay. that's it's what like it's a protest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, I'm communicating to the people in the know that I don't approve of this message. We start with a disclaimer. This motion picture is based on an actual incident. Last year, 26 horror films were released. None of them lost money. Did you fact check that? Uh, we covered more than 26 horror films for 1980. Okay. Uh, but they all did make money pretty okay. much. All right. Also, I was very confused. I did not know that this was a comedy. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and so How like, long did it take you to figure it out? Well, uh, one I, minute tops. I, I, I would say it was the second opening of the house. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's when I was like, I was like, okay, that was a weird tidbit yeah to put at the beginning but okay we open picture on a two-story home in the suburbs at night we see a producer credit for alan smithy but for some reason it's spelled a-l-l-e-n instead of the traditional a-l-a-n apparently both are acceptable but i'm used to seeing the other one as the subtitle halloween appears we hear a turkey gobble <laughs> the joke here being that turkeys are typically affiliated <laughs> with a different holiday <laughs> i i'm not <laughs> I just want to make it clear. I'm not laughing at that joke, but your delivery of yes. the joke. <laughs> no, I get it. I just want to be clear. This movie is not funny. <laughs> we dip to black, but then come back up to the same picture, except that the red car in the driveway has been replaced with a yellow one. And now the subtitle reads Friday the 13th, presumably 13 days after Halloween. Oh, I thought that the joke was that. It was Halloween that and Halloween Friday the 13th. Halloween can't be Friday the 13th, right. but they're saying it was. We dip to black again and come back up slightly closer and the subtitle reads Jamie Lee Curtis's birthday, nine days later. In the POV of a heavy breather, we approach the house and the breathing gets more and more ragged and disturbing to listen to. Very quickly, I'm tired of it. Yeah. Yeah. Even though the front door has four huge windows in it, the POV peeks through a mail slot. The phone rings inside and babysitter Julie answers on behalf of the Hummers family. On the table in front of her sits a can of Dr. Pepper. It's her friend Toby calling to remind her in preparation for tomorrow's test that the North won the Civil War. Julie invites Toby to bring some boys over to the house and Toby turns the offer down, warning her that promiscuity can lead to danger. After she hangs up, Julie steps away to investigate a meowing outside and finds a dog in the front yard, meowing and farting. Was it also farting? Yes, it first, was. First it's meowing and then it lifts a leg to pee and they put in a fart oh, sound effect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's gotta just keep layering them. Yeah, it's really like the jokes per second here are just impressive. It's already funny because dogs bark, they don't meow, and then the added fart is just icing on the cake. When Julie closes the door again, she neglects to lock it, and suddenly the word unlocked is blinking on screen, where it is eventually joined by an arrow pointing directly to the locking mechanism in the unlocked position. The phone rings again, and it's the heavy breather. She hangs up, and it rings again. I said, 
She hangs up again, and in the silence we hear a wolf howl, and then a frantic psycho-esque score begins, and it rings a third time. Julie answers one more time, and the score blares at her through the phone. I know that we started this film off with the fact that there were 26 horror films last year and they yes. all made money. But, like, 1980 was really kind of the, the dawn of that era, of that kind of film, wasn't it? Um, 79 had a lot. Well, but um, still, like... Maybe a year or two of this kind of film. And I realize that there might have been a, a lot of them in that sure. year or two. But is that long enough to really have established these as tropes? I think so. Uh, because it. I think it went back to like the mid-70s. Mm. Um, or even like we had Bay of Blood in 72. But moving forward from Bay of Blood, there were already very quickly movies that kind of jumped on this genre of the slasher where... You know, you're killing a lot of people. Obviously, it got kicked into high gear in the 80s. But even, like, The Burning was a response to Friday the 13th. And that was a serious horror film that used so many tropes from the earlier films. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, I guess. I just feel like they're very quickly m jumping on the let's make fun of it bandwagon when it hasn't even been around long enough to be a joke yet. I think what happened was these people weren't creative enough to write a horror film and profit off of the wave so they decided we'll just pick like 20 to watch and then we'll write jokes based on what we've seen in those yeah i just if you're thinking back to something like airplane and yeah. and how that's kind of making fun of this uh i don't even know what they're called but the well the movies were called airport well, yeah. But it's, it's not even making fun of those. Right, Because it right. seems like it's a direct parody of a specific Z yeah, film, Zero, Zero Hour. Hour. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, like enough time had passed that there was something appealing about going back to yeah. that and, 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 and making sort of a joke out of it. I, th I think slashers were huge, and this movie didn't take very long to write. And they decided that they were going to jump on the slasher wagon by making the first... And I think this is the first slasher comedy. This was the first one that was specifically spoofing the slasher genre. Yeah. Okay. I'm also impressed about that Jamie Lee Curtis was already established as a scream queen enough for them to include her name. Well, obviously Halloween was huge. Right. And then she came back Terror last Train. year with Terror Train and Prom right. Night. Prom Night, yeah. And The Fog. And The Fog. That's right. She was in three horror films last year. All made money. Julie ignores the fourth ring of the phone as long as she can, but eventually the phone is bouncing all over the table. When she answers, the frantic heavy breather on the other side sounds droolier than before, and suddenly saliva, I hope, yeah. is pouring out of the yeah. is pouring out of the microphone end of the phone. But it looks significantly milkier than saliva. Yeah. I'm I'm hoping it's for visibility. Yeah. That they were like this isn't reading drool. It's Let's just, make it thicker and thicker. It's just frothy from having gone through the phone holes. <laughs> it doesn't turn white like that. <laughs> Julie is disgusted and moves to the kitchen to wash her hands. Not thoroughly enough for my taste, but whatever. We see a lot of KFC leftovers littering the countertop. In the refrigerator, she finds lots of Coors, Dr. Pepper, and Dunkin' Donuts products and picks up a drumstick off of a KFC branded plate. Before she can get it to her mouth, she's attacked by a man in shadow and screams. It's her boyfriend Charlie, of course. Surprise! Charlie! He kisses her forcefully. Oh, what's that chickeny taste? It's chicken! <laughs> Please tell me we don't do any do you remember the last times in this because I will be very annoyed. There's a lot of them. No. Get ready. No! Okay, do you remember the last time a boyfriend snuck up on his girlfriend and scared her and we thought it was a killer? Do I? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have that for this one, no. What, what is it? Uh, Bay of Blood, we did that. Did we do that? He also It also happened in Bloody Birthday, I remember. That's the one I'm thinking of. Where is he it? snuck, he, he came home from college early yeah. when the uh, people were getting killed in the town. Yes. Charlie is ready to have sex right here in the kitchen, but Julie has another plan. Not here. Not now. Where? Yeah. Upstairs? Ten seconds? We cut back to that first exterior again, and I fully expected a new subtitle like Easter or something, but all we see is a light coming on upstairs. Julie makes Charlie shower before sex and undresses while she waits. 
We switch back to the heavy breather's POV as he moves around the house. He opens a roll-top desk, and inside we find rat poison, a dagger, a noose, a gun, a letter opener, a knife, an axe, a serrated knife. I was really disappointed that they just weren't all clue weapons. Yeah, yeah. that would be good. I was like, you had the perfect setup. It was almost all there. Yeah. But the breather's hands, wearing dishwasher gloves, float back and forth over the array of weapons and settle on a paper clip. The hands bend the paper clip into some semblance of a weapon, I guess. Next, we see the breather climbing the stairs. The heavy breather complains about all those stairs on the way to the second floor and eventually starts tiptoeing his fingers up the railing until his hand steps in gum. Immediately, his boots are also stepping in gum. His yeah. hand steps in gum? Yeah, because his hand is walking. Oh, okay. Fair. <laughs> Immediately, his boots are also stepping in gum, and the breather panics. Not unlike Marv from the Wet Bandits, the breather is forced to remove his boots to escape the gum. Charlie is drying his hair in the bathroom and can't hear Julie calling for him. The breather enters the bedroom and gets a hand over Julie's mouth before stabbing her to death with the paper clip. Or a bunch of paper clips. We don't know that yet. That's why I said or. <laughs> <laughs> when Charlie returns from the bathroom fully nude, he is disappointed to find her cold in bed. Julie, you're not responding to my maleness. <laughs> <laughs> I like that line. Suddenly, the killer approaches Charlie with a big black hefty bag and he screams. Holy shit! No! We cut back outside and the Hummers return home from their movie date. They park a third car, blue this time, in their driveway. They complain about wasting $30 on their date night, but the $30 includes the movie tickets, the popcorn, the parking, and the babysitter. So that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I, 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 the one of the sensible chuckles I got from was their uh, discussion of how bad horror films are. Right. It's like, I can't believe people want to watch that trash. Yeah, let's get home so we can watch Dukes of Hazard. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, ouch for Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> They lament the glut of horror films despite apparently having bought tickets to one on purpose. And if I see one more horror film, I'll throw up. What makes them think the American public wants to watch such stupid trash? Obviously, this sentiment is what inspired the writing of the film. When they get inside, they have trouble locating Julie. Where is that girl? I hope she wasn't murdered in our bed. From outside the house, we hear Mrs. Hummers let out a shriek. But inside, we see she's terrified by a sink overflowing with dishes. She complains that for 75 cents an hour, she expected the kitchen to be spotless when they returned. Mr. Hummers notices the chicken Julie dropped when Charlie surprised her. Apparently, it broke into pieces when it hit the floor. Hmm. Chicken. Hmm. Broken. He picks up the drumstick and wraps a rubber band around it to hold the pieces together before putting it back in the refrigerator. Okay, this was about the only thing I found amusing in this movie. <laughs> I think they're counting on every person finding one joke funny. <laughs> because there's too many jokes to miss everybody. It's the shotgun effect. Mrs. Hummers screams again when she notices the television was left on. Mr. Hummers wipes the saliva or semen off the phone... <laughs> And we hear the breather still breathing through it. Can't it be both? <laughs> <laughs> Por que no los dos? <laughs> Next, Mrs. Hummers is disappointed to find the stairs filthy with gum and boots. In her bedroom, she finds the corpse of the babysitter and a big trash bag with Charlie's remains inside. Numbers appear on screen to count the bodies thus far. The important thing is that you calm down and relax. Well, I'll be darned. Joke here also being that she doesn't scream this right. time. She doesn't care at all when she finds the bodies, but those other things freaked her out. But Mr. Hummers shows up and he screams at the sight of Julie's body, riddled with paper clips stabbed into her face. And we see now that the killer has used like the whole box of paper clips and stabbed them all over her face. We cut to a funeral on campus the next day and the school band is playing a slowed down version of Beethoven's Ode to Joy. A cheer squad is here with black pom-poms as the principal reads a eulogy. For me to look down on the corpses of two former students is very painful. And I'll bet it's no picnic for their parents either. The principal explains that due to budget cuts, today is a very big day at La Mob High. After the funeral, they have a big parade, the big game, the big dance, the big panty raid, etc. All the big events that work as the centerpiece of these types of slashers. The film was shot at Lamar Consolidated Junior High School and originally took place at Lamar High, but to avoid being confused for the actual Lamar High School in Houston, the shooting location of Wes Anderson's Rushmore, all posters bearing the name of the school were altered 
from reading Lamar to Lamab because it was easy enough to change an R into a B. So all spoken references were changed with ADR. Oh. Toby, among the mourners, complains to her boyfriend Hardy that she warned Julie to stay out of danger last night. Another male student, Joe, starts kissing his girlfriend Bertha in the middle of the eulogy. Funerals get me hot. The principal finishes his speech and hands it over to the cheerleaders. Okay! Give me a boo! Give me a hoo! Give me a boo! Hoo! Hoo! Be dead! Just before the coffins are lowered into the ground, Malvert, the school janitor, steps forward and points at the coffins with his dishwasher gloved hands. Sex kills. Sex kills. Back, Malvert! Back! Do you want people to be suspicious of you? Suddenly, Bertha and Joe run off to their car to get it on. As they leave, we get inserts of almost every member of the faculty seemingly bothered by their departure. Bertha tells Joe that her mom found her diaphragm, and he runs off to the pharmacy for supplies. I'll get foam and rubbers. Don't start without me. While she waits for him to return, more titles on screen point out that Joe left the car door unlocked and the window rolled down. Suddenly, a wooden horse is peeking into the car. You who? Anybody home? Joe? What's that? I'm gonna give you a horse head. Get out, Joe! The killer bashes Bertha repeatedly in the face with what looks like a kaleidoscopic shot, and eventually her eyes are crossed, and the titles tally a third death in the film. When Joe gets back, he finds Bertha across the back seat with her eyes crossed. Ah, uh, you started without me. Before he can determine if she's still alive, another hefty bag is thrown over his head. Mrs. Hummers locates Julie's parents in the funeral crowd and introduces herself. She hands them an envelope with Julia's paycheck for the babysitting. It's all there, five hours, 65 cents an hour. Oh, and I also included Julie's car fare, one way, of course. So Mrs. Hummers shaved 10 cents an hour off the dead girl's pay, because who's to know? Toby and Hardy are walking through the cemetery and find the bodies of Bertha and Joe, but assume at first that it's a joke in poor taste. Later that day, we see two cars collide in the school parking lot. One is being driven by a seeing eye dog, and the other by a man paralyzed from the waist down. The blind man in the passenger seat of the dog-driven car is quick to pick a fight with the driver in the wheelchair. Hey man, that's my parking space. Can't you see I'm blind? Hey, I'm more handicapped than you. I can't even make love to a woman. I can never find one. I'll move it. While they argue, a 1975 Maserati pulls into the spot they're fighting over, and a popular girl, Patty Priswell, climbs out. Great physical beauty can be a handicap too. Toby and Hardy argue over who could possibly be the killer. Hardy thinks it could be anybody, but Toby thinks it has to be somebody. And they go back and forth like that for a while. The principal tells his second-in-command, Mrs. Mumsley, that the killer is certain to make his day more difficult. Just before the bell rings, a bus arrives from Africa, and a student in a dashiki gets out to run to his first class, Woodshop. Mr. Dumpkin begins class and announces that today they'll be making horsehead bookends. Judging from the decor of the room, this is all they ever make in this class, and everyone erupts into annoyed grunts. Perhaps man's highest cultural achievement is the horsehead bookend. He angrily saws some wood in half while bemoaning the indecency of modern America. He notices the student from Africa arriving late to class and launches into a racist tirade. Just a minute, son. Visa? Yeah, yeah. The one in the bed sheet. Take that tambourine off your head. He belongs to the school. Yes, sir. My name is Mawamba. Mawamba explains that he's arriving here late on the last day of school because he buses all the way from Africa and has consequently missed the entire school year. We cut away from this conversation to Toby digging through a bag under her desk. A title on screen with an arrow labels this bag, Clues. Mr. Dumpkin asks why Mwamba couldn't go to school in his own neighborhood, and he cites a court order. Court order, huh? Court order? Now the right people have taken over this country. You're going to see some real court orders. Now sit down and make horse heads. Presumably a lot of racist people in the country were very excited about Reagan's recent election. Toby shows Hardy a bloody horsehead bookend that she found at the scene of Bertha's murder. Now we get probably my second favorite line from the entire film from Mr. Dumpkin. Talking? During horsehead bookends? I don't know why, but his delivery there just killed me. Such a weirdly specific thing, horsehead bookends. Well, I was going to ask, like... I mean, I feel like there's classic things that you make in shop class, like a like a birdhouse is kind of one of those yeah. classic 
shop class tropes. I, is, I we didn't even have a shop class. Well, in my high we school. didn't either. But is I feel like even in other television and movies and stuff, horsehead bookends is not something I ever would have thought of. No, <laughs> me neither. But I think that's part of why I like it so much. Is that it's such a random thing. I also really like the way this guy's delivering almost every line that he has. They He's had, one of the better actors in this film. They had to think of some sort of bookend that would be kind of stabby like. I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Got uh, a horse nose sticking out to stab with. Um, it kind of reminded me of the Pete and Pete episode where older Pete is in metal shop and they're the teacher is having them individually work on components because he's building something and yeah. Pete's trying to figure out what it is <laughs> by getting glimpses of everyone else's stuff. Yeah, that's and fun. it ends up being an air conditioning. <laughs> that's awesome for the classroom. Uh, for his, for the teacher's office. Oh, okay, that's fine. Duncan notices Toby is hiding the bloodied bookend under her sweater and yanks it away. He refers to her here as Miss shouldn't be in the class anyway. Duncan seems impressed with the workmanship and even compliments the stain job, which is really just blood spatter on the nose of the horse. I couldn't have done a better job myself. That's what I was thinking. The words suspect blink on screen over a shot of Dumpkin, even though he seems like he's not a suspect because he was just impressed by this horse head bookend and mistook the blood for a stain. We cut right to the girls' locker room. Patty brags to the others about how pretty she is and always will be. She even keeps cyanide capsules in her locker for the first sign of wrinkles. Death before disfigurement. You're sick. Has anybody seen Toby? Suddenly we're back in the killer's POV watching these girls from seemingly out in the open and talking very loudly about how much the breather loves girls and sweat and boobs, etc. I love locker rooms. I trust any girl who isn't I love girls' locker rooms. I love sweat. I I love girls' sweat. I love my house, I love my family, I love my mom. Don't make that analogy. (laughs) The POV camera work here is infuriatingly frantic and hops all over the place until the breather finally collapses and then recovers one minute later, according to another title card. Earlier in the day, Toby was wearing a pin on her shirt that said no, and now that she's alone in the locker room and undressed to her bra, we see it bears a much larger pin that reads, for the last time I said no. I, I do really like the no pin. Yeah. Because it's just like as if she's taking a stance on something, but you don't know, you'll never know what it is. I think it's put my clothes back on. I didn't uh, want to sleep with you. But I think uh, there's there's two people writing this movie and there's one that's really not funny. And there's another person that's really funny. So there's jokes that are structured well and written well, but they're poorly directed. Yeah. I feel like that happens over and over throughout the script where you're just like, that was really funny. That should have been the point of this scene. I don't know if I'd say really funny. There's there's smart jokes in this. For example, remember when the teacher said, talking during horsehead bookends? That's really funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care about it. Toby seems to be the only one who can hear the breather and runs from the locker room to escape him. We see the breather give chase with only shots of their feet, and the breather laments his choice of victim. My luck, I picked a jogger. <laughs> which reminded me specifically of Graduation Day, where the killer decided to kill the entire track team for some yeah. reason. <laughs> At the conclusion of the chase, we see that Toby has been running through the entire school in just her bra with her shirt in her hands. She gets to a boiler room, and in pursuit, the killer steps in more gum. I'd like to kill the kid with the gum. Toby crashes into Malvert in the boiler room, and he asks if she wants to be Mrs. Malvert. He tells her he has a huge problem and reaches into his pants. Luckily, he pulls out a crossword puzzle and reads her a clue he needs help with. Five-letter word for stealth like creep! Which doesn't really fit the clue very well, but it fits the space he points to with a pencil. I think it does. I, I think the other form of the word creep, like to, you know, like... You gotta like creep. Walking but, creep. Like but the creep. clue, as he reads it here, and it changes later, is stealth-like. Creep is not another word for stealth-like. But if you're creeping through your house to not make noise, that is stealth-like. Yeah, if you're creeping through your house to make... But the word creep is the wrong tense for the clue stealth-like. Mm, creep, creep is the verb. Yeah. Stealth-like is not, is not a verb. Okay, I see what you're saying then. Yeah. Oh, so it's like to walk stealthily would be to creep. Yes. Okay. We repeat the clue later and we call it stealth-like movement, which creep fits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But stealth-like by itself is just an adjective. Yeah. Yeah. 
Unfortunately for Malvert, all of his answers are very wrong in this crossword puzzle, and almost none of what he has filled in so far are actual words. <laughs> I paused it and I was like trying so hard to read it because it's just nonsense. We cut from here to the big parade. Principal Peters and Mrs. Van Dyke are standing at the microphone together. Lovely day for a parade. Or a murder. Yeah. <laughs> a marching band leads floats down the street. The Lamar High Marching Band, the finest marching band on this street at this moment. <laughs> it's another joke where it's like, that's kind of funny. And a lot of the, the, I think the principal gets a lot of the funnier lines too. A student, Dagmar, sits atop a giant bull float in the parade. Here we get my favorite joke in the film from the principal. I'd like to make a special appeal to the killer. Hasn't there been enough senseless killing? Let's have a murder that makes sense. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's a great line. I don't know. <laughs> it's slim pickings here. We got to celebrate the jokes that we can yep. find. If you would like to explain every joke and make it more funny, keep going. All right. <laughs> Basically, the joke here. No. We notice the killer's boots standing among the marching band. The candidates for prom queen have dwindled to just three names. Meet Patty Briswell, Joan DeMico, and Barry, our boy queen candidate. Barry sports an I'm a Pepper shirt because we haven't seen enough product placement for Dr. Pepper yet in this movie. Dagmar's boyfriend Ralph climbs her float to join her in the bull mascot, or I guess in the, the platform below yeah. the bull mascot. Together they climb down into the platform. Couldn't you pick a better place? I can't help it. Hollow bulls get me hot. This, this this just occurred to me. <laughs> there there was an old form of torture where they would put you inside a metal bowl and then heat it up with fire. Bowl or bull? Bull. Interesting. I, I have to look it up. Are you saying that that's a reference to this? No, I'm not saying the movie is oh. that smart, but... Do you guys recall the last time that we misheard the word bull as the word bowl? Oh, uh, that religious movie. Uh image of the beast there you go <laughs> yeah it's called the brazen bull uh torture execution device in ancient greece uh so yeah. hollow bulls did make some people hot yeah that's what i was saying like <laughs> <laughs> that's where i was going with that interesting that's a really smart joke if yeah. that was the i answer. guarantee Almost you that's not what they not. meant <laughs> there's there's another joke coming up that's not what they meant either we hear the breather inside the float with them, searching for a murder weapon, and in keeping with the pattern, Dagmar's boyfriend leaves her alone for a moment. The breather settles on an eggplant as a murder weapon, and by the time Ralph returns, she is dead. What's this? I thought you hated eggplant. Obviously, eggplants were not a common penis reference at the time, so it was probably just supposed to be a nonsense joke. Yeah. Next, Ralph is wrapped up in a hefty bag before Toby can get inside the float to check on them. The breather pushes both corpses out of the float. Student bodies! Student bodies! And the school nurse checks their vitals. Out of nowhere, we cut to a desk in an office, and the man sitting behind it explains that an R rating is only awarded to films with nudity, graphic violence, or an F-bomb in reference to a sex act. Since this film has none of those, and since research has proven that R-rated films are by far the most popular with the movie-going public, the producers of this motion picture have asked me to take this opportunity to say, fuck you. This was literally added to the film to ensure an R rating. Well, I feel like everything else that they've done thus far had already said fuck you to us. So right. yeah. <laughs> they're just saying it explicitly redundant. Now. Yeah. <laughs> well, the other thing that's weird, though, is that I don't remember another F-bomb. And if this is their only F-bomb and it's not specifically in reference to a sex act, then it still doesn't meet the qualifications i mean i suppose you can ask for an r rating can't you i mean presumably but like, why wouldn't you just put boobs in the movie if you really <laughs> do that? doesn't that bring more people yeah why wouldn't they just make it more gratuitous oh, we, we do get all those uh, anatomy shots in the uh, school nurse's office it's just like the yeah. posters like yeah. the scientific anatomy we cut to the r rating certificate and then back to the film the school nurse confirms the deaths of Dagmar and Ralph just as Toby is climbing out of the float, incriminating herself. Mr. Dumpkin wants to know what she's doing here with an eggplant. What have we here, Miss Shouldn't Be On The Float, anyway? We cut to a biology class being taught by Mrs. Van Dyke. She's telling the class how useless penises are. Uh, now, we can't go around uh, changing man's anatomy, legally that is, but we can change the frogs. Now, if you will all please expose your frogs. Uh, first, uh, we will remove all these ugly little frog penises. 
Throughout the lecture, her class argues over Toby's innocence or guilt, and we cut to Toby being interrogated in the principal's office. She insists that she would never hurt a fly before swatting one and proving her guilt. The death counter considers a fly half a person, and so we're up to six and a half kills. Oh, man. If it's half a person, I have a pretty high body count at I this think point. so, yeah. The principal suggests sending Toby to the school psychiatrist, Dr. Sigmund, rather than sending her directly to jail. And let a pass go and collect $200? No way. It's not a terrible joke, but in the game of Monopoly, when you were sent directly to jail, the point of the word directly is that you do not pass go and you do not collect $200. Well, he, yeah, he was saying that by not going directly to jail, she has a chance to pass go. Okay, I see. The movie is smarter than me. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Toby appreciates being given another chance before resorting to jail. Goodbye and... And thanks for your confidence in me, Mr. Peters. Not really confidence, my dear. I think you're crazy. After Toby leaves the office, the principal starts sorting through all the clues in the case when Malvert walks into the office and starts peeing in a trash can in the corner. Apparently this office used to be the restroom, and Malvert hasn't figured it out yet. Malvert used to be a teacher here, but he was in a terrible car accident, which did damage to his brain. Malvert was transferred to being a janitor here after the accident. Poor soul. Once the teacher, now a janitor. He does enjoy the raisin pay. <laughs> I, I missed I miss that, miss that joke. I missed that joke too. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're afford hookers. The calendar on the wall in Principal Peter's office says it's March, even though the opening titles said it was November and the coach said it was June. <laughs> so a lot of conflicting timestamps. The cowboy looking dude in the principal's office, who was leading the interrogation, and wearing a Coors Light shirt is apparently a cop because he has a badge on his denim jacket. Yeah, I wasn't sure who he was at all. Yeah, he shows up a few more times, but he is a cop. He suddenly suspects that Malvert might have done the killing because of the blood on his hands, but Malvert explains that he sometimes pees red. The phone on the principal's desk rings, and for some reason, Miss Van Dyke gets to it first to answer. I'll get it. I'm farthest from the phone. That makes sense. It's the killer this time, disguising his voice by speaking through a rubber chicken. I thought it sounded like he was speaking through a rubber chicken. The killer announces his next victim will die at the football game. Click. Did you hang up? No, I just said click. We cut away to Toby meeting Dr. Sigmund. She's immediately on the verge of tears. Unfortunately, the doctor is out of tissues but offers her the empty box, which she uses to dab her eyes. Thank you, Dr. Sigmund. Don't be so formal. Call me Pisher. She calls him doctor again and is corrected again, but differently. Please, don't be so formal. Call me daddy. Uh, daddy? He claims to want to be a father figure to his many disturbed patients, and he stands to tilt all of the framed paperwork around his office slightly off balance. He then moves things around on his desk as if compelled to by an obsessive compulsive disorder. When he turns the receiver around on his desk phone, we hear another snippet of the heavy breather through it. Sigmund asks Toby what she thinks of sex, and she has conflicting thoughts. It can be beautiful. But at the same time, it can be so ugly and, and dirty and disgusting. Yeah, my father. Your father's name is Yuck? Tell me about your father. Did you like Yuck? Oh, no, I hated him. She mentions how her father drilled it into her head that sex was disgusting. When she mentions that her father used to lock her in her room, Sigmund advises her not to call him daddy anymore. And your mother? What did she tell you? She also told me that sex was bad and dirty. Uh, but only with my father. With everyone else, she said it was great. <laughs> the doctor tears a card from his Rolodex to offer as another tissue. Before the appointment ends, they complete the rule of threes when the doctor offers his pipe to wipe away her tears. We cut to an English class, and someone makes the Hamlet slash Great Dane joke that we've already discussed twice now. Do you guys recall the episodes where we've brought up Hamlet as a Great Dane? Yes. The ninth All right, I believe you. You don't have to say any more. Oh. No, I'm kidding. What were they? The, the ninth configuration and oh, it was more recent than that one. Mm -hmm. um, it's an 81 title. Richard, any ideas? Nothing. Sea Wolves. Ah. Uh. When he's talking to the lady, she says that her dog's name is Hamlet, but that he's not a Great Dane. Toby arrives late to class just as Principal Peters hops on the PA to remind the students that even though Toby is the suspected murderer, 
that she should be treated just like everyone else. The entire class empties into the hall. In the principal's office, Mumsley is trying to calm Peter's nerves and suggests that he make a school-wide announcement, since that usually helps, but he literally just finished making one. When he jumps on the mic, we cut back to the English class, somehow full of students again, and one throws a tomato at the PA speaker, <laughs> and somehow it splatters across the principal's face in his office. I, I, did, I did chuckle at this joke. He tells the school that the murderer is clearly dangerous and psychotic, but they have no idea who it is, which isn't super different from the last announcement that he just made. In the montage of reactions, we see Dr. Sigmund in the men's bathroom wearing his suit backwards, a la Tom Green's backwards man bit. I'm the backwards man, the backwards man, the backwards man, the backwards man. I can walk backwards fast as you can. I can walk backwards fast as you can. I'm the backwards man, the backwards man. What, what is the point of this? To show us that the doctor's crazy. That's it? Yeah. Okay. Outside the school, Mumsley tells Malvert that if Principal Peters is implicated in the investigation, then for the good of the school, Malvert should confess to the killings since he's weird anyway and it won't hurt his sex life. Well, Mr. Peters is a valuable asset to society, while you are mere scum. What difference would jail make to you? You'll have fun with the boys. Women don't like you much now. I certainly don't. Homosexuality is the up-and-coming thing. The whole time she's speaking, Malvert is picking up discarded food from the grass and eating it. And I feel bad for this guy, because it looks gross. Yeah. It, it might be worth mentioning that he is also very very tall and skinny yeah he almost looks like he has like marfan syndrome or something well he is like multiple jointed yeah on, on several of his appendages yeah. yeah he's extremely flexible guy but it's fascinating to watch him move because his legs and arms are so long and skinny that it just it's it's you know it's very odd yeah we cut to a football game and it looks like nfl players against children when the ref tosses a coin, the bigger quarterback snatches it out of the air. Nine. <laughs> that made me laugh, too. <laughs> Malvert is in the audience with a blow-up doll. The hot dog vendors are wildly abusive to their customers, shoving food in their mouths and spraying their faces with condiments and beverages. But everyone seems to put up with it. When Malvert rises to order his date a hot dog, she floats away, evidently inflated with helium. <laughs> <laughs> All women alike! All women are in Malvert! Everyone in the crowd is wearing either a Dr. Pepper hat or a Coors hat. <laughs> Dumpkin and the nurse argue over how quickly a student would suffocate in a hefty bag, and Dumpkin tests the theory on Mawamba. They stuff him in a bag and just leave him on the field to die. That's the joke. They just left the African student in a bag and killed him. The end. They don't, they don't count his body towards no, the body they don't. count either. Yeah. When the entire smaller football team is knocked unconscious except the kid with the ball, he does a quick impression of Richard Pryor from Stir Crazy to sneak past them. I'm bad. That's right, I'm bad. Hey, blood. Hey, bro, what's happened? Hey, blood. Mwamba dies in his trash bag. Another student couple, Al and Joan, decide to have sex in public again and explore under the bleachers, home to a constant avalanche of garbage. The garbage gets me hot. Joan complains about the mess, and Al leaves to retrieve a broom and blanket. Toby leaves to watch them, despite Hardy's warning against it. The breather spots Joan under the bleachers and approaches with a chalk duster in his hand. Even though she can plainly see the killer's face, she still assumes at first that it is her boyfriend, because that is the way. <laughs> you must always say your boyfriend's name, which is helpful to me, because I need to know these characters' names. <laughs> Here's breather. <laughs> On the field, the last of the little players escapes a dog pile with the ball in just his helmet and boxers and runs for a touchdown. Toby sees Joan under the bleachers but is suddenly knocked unconscious by a bit of falling trash, I think an empty paper cup. Because this is so outlandish, the titles have to appear and explain what just happened. Unconscious, not dead, important plot point. Al returns with a top-of-the-line broom and blanket to find Joan dead with an eraser in her mouth. Weirdly, the death count is now seven, meaning that Joan was only half a person after the fly that Toby killed brought us to six and a half. Oh. This also means that Mwamba counts as zero people. Of oh. course, Al is immediately wrapped in a hefty bag. I didn't catch that. I forgot. I'm like, how did we get back to round numbers? Yeah. Joan doesn't count as much. A ref is tackled on the field, and when the crowd clears, Joan's body and Al's bag have been repositioned where they were. No touchdown. Dead bodies downfield. 15-yard penalty. 
The Coors Cowboy cop addresses the crowd about the new double murder. He excuses everyone with no prior charges and half of them leave. Next, the motiveless are excused, leaving only Malvert, who stands to leave in the third group. All right now, all those whose parents are of the same sex, you can go. Toby regains consciousness and sneaks into the ambulance with the bodies to avoid being caught at the scene. I mean, what is the, what is the joke there? First of all, if Toby were in this group, she would have been excused with the first batch because she right. doesn't have any charges. No one's charged her with anything yet. Then the joke is that if your parents are gay, you couldn't have killed anyone. Is that the joke? That's the joke. I guess. And, and it's just like, get it? Because Malvert's parents are gay. I guess. Great. Hardy follows the ambulance on his bike. Turns out they didn't bring the bodies to the hospital, but the school nurse's office. The cop interrogates Hardy as to Toby's location. He tries to scare him straight by showing him the corpse, and everyone averts their eyes so that only Hardy can see Toby is here on the gurney under the blanket with Al's body. Al's corpse farts and the room is disgusted, but the nurse explains it's normal. There's an old whelp saying dead men tell no tales, but they fart. I wasn't clear that it was the body. I thought Same. it was Toby and like not being able to control herself and they were just blaming it on the body. Well, it seems like she's disgusted by it later. So maybe the first fart was hers and then later it's the No, oh, they're probably both the the dead body, but I I kind of assumed it was her, but you're probably right that they wouldn't have played up her also being disgusted if it was right. her own. Yeah, because if I love my farts, I don't know about you guys, <laughs> you kind of love your own brand. Yeah, oh, God. homebrew. Uh. <laughs> the nurse also mentions that the dead can get erections, and we get the requisite as Toby notices a bulge. The phone rings, and the English teacher mistakes it for another higher pitch fart, but it's the killer calling. <laughs> <laughs> I did laugh. At that She's one like, too. that was a high pitch one. <laughs> Now would be a great time for Toby to reveal herself and clear her name while they're on the phone with the actual killer, but right. instead she stays hidden. The killer announces that his next kill will happen at prom, and Van Dyke takes the opportunity to prank him back. Oh yeah? Click. Did you hang up? <laughs> no, it just said click. <laughs> I <I've> got him. <laughs> that made me laugh. The fact that she's so pleased with herself for it. Another dead fart clears the room and apparently knocks Toby unconscious. Hardy wakes her up and a third fart rockets the gurney in the wrong direction through the door into the hallway. But his butt is pointed toward the door and then when he farted he got blasted through the door. Right, right. Hardy leads Toby through the drama department which is littered with costumes and wigs from their upcoming non-musical version of Grease. <laughs> Toby wants to get to prom to prevent the next kill and decides to go in one of these costumes. For some reason... This scene alone is spelled out with a picture-in-picture -picture American Sign Language translation. The window is just a black circle with the dishwasher-gloved hands of the killer doing the gestures. The picture suddenly cuts to static, and the breather addresses us directly to remind us of all the red herrings that the film has introduced so far. In this montage, we also learn that the principal lures mice into his pants with cheese. Important plot point, apparently. Yes. Outside the prom, Hardy can't take his eyes off Toby's breasts. She claims to have filled her top with balloons, and the boobs squeak whenever she touches them. And they will for the rest of the movie. Yep. Someone's POV watches them talk. She makes a vague plan to get Principal Peter's keys to go through the student records in his office. Inside the dance, Malvert is twirling his inflatable lady friend, and his dance moves look completely incredible. I don't understand how he can move like this. He moves like a marionette. Yeah. And his legs are so skinny that at times I was convinced that they were empty pants that were just being like stapled to something. And it's like, no, he's actually bending it at that angle. I don't understand. That's so crazy. Toby is approached by several interested boys as soon as she gets inside. Patty tells her ROTC boyfriend Scott that all she cares about is taking home the prom queen crown tonight. Malvert drinks from the punch bowl like a dog until he is shooed away, at which point he claims to have helped make the drink. Malvert helped make punch. What are you talking about? Albert P. Red. Everyone spits their drinks out, which I'm sure is not the product placement they were looking for when Dunkin' Donuts gave them all these branded cups for the scene. It's possible that these were actual product placement deals, but I'm kind of tempted to believe that they were included as a reference to product placement in other horror films. Yeah. I mean, I think they were, but they do list them in the credits. They're That's all true. listed, so I feel like... They they were tied to money. I mean, I guess if you can make the product placement a joke too, then why not? Like you know, Wayne's World. You know. Yeah, and I think the the brands the brands might have actually liked that. Sure. 
except for this one where everyone's drinking bloody pee out of Dunkin' Donuts cups. <laughs> but like who I, hasn't? <laughs> right. Uh, do you remember the last time someone drank pee? Oh, my God. It was... Um, go, not Gorb. Gorb? No, the other one. The um, Fuck, what was the name of that movie? Up the Academy? That's it. Up the I Academy? I don't think so. No? no Did it's someone with... drink pee in that? <laughs> they replaced I, the punch with... Uh, with P in, and they was at the dance, and there was the bad singers. No, that no. wasn't up the academy. That was uh. What was there? The, there is punch at the uh, dance in up uh, the academy, but it's not. Oh, doesn't have P in it. Hollywood Nights. Wait, Hollywood Nights does have P in it. I think you're right, also, because or maybe maybe Ron Liebman just keeps making a joke about pissing in a punch bowl or something like that. I don't know. I can't remember. Can't keep them straight. <laughs> Cutting Hollywood, all this out. But Hollywood Nights. Hollywood sure. Nights definitely has it because they they do it to get back at the neighborhood watch group. That's that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, but I I oh you know what no, <laughs> in Up the Academy it's a turd in the punch bowl. Oh, okay. <laughs> Glad we figured out <laughs> which human waste went in which punch bowl. Toby poses as a new student and flirts a bit with the principal, but when she grabs for the keys, she accidentally clocks him in the crotch with them because they're on a retractable chain and they snap back shut on him. She steps away again. Patty thinks Toby is here in costume to steal her crown, and her boyfriend Scott offers to test the theory. I'll find out. We're going to dance with her, and if I don't get a hard on, it's Toby for sure. <laughs> That's another chuckle for me. <laughs> Toby starts making out with Hardy, and all the old men watching her start sweating. Patty and Scott seem convinced, meaning that Scott has a heart on already, I think, is the joke there. Hardy tells her how he feels about her, and they agree to resume this conversation when things are back to normal. Toby taps on Malvert's shoulder to enlist his help in getting the keys. Mr. Malvert! Scare Malvert! You know Malvert? Yes, I know Malvert. Uh, remember five little word for self-like movement? Creep? You're Mrs. Malvert! Uh, yes, yes, Mrs. Malvert. Listen, you've got to come help me. Mr. Dumpkin runs to his classroom to cut some horsehead bookends to cure his horniness. Malvert uses his incredible stretchiness to distract the principal and steal his keys. When he gets back to Toby, he pulls a Milo from the mask bit Not the cheese, the keys. by presenting Toby with a wedge of cheese from the principal's pants first, between his own legs from behind, which I can't even fathom how to do that. Uh, I said his keys, not his cheese. Oh, oh, Malvert. You're wonderful. <laughs> I'm also glad that you made the mask yeah. reference. I was like, if he doesn't make it, I'm going to make it. <laughs> Mumsley tries to speak to the students and instructs Scott to fire around into the gym ceiling to get everyone's attention. She tells the class that because there are so few candidates left, none of them will have a shot at prom queen, and she's awarding it to Principal Peters. Scott tries to cheer up Patty by offering sex, and they leave together to the woodshop classroom. Dumpkin hides in a cabinet to spy on them. Patty says all the horse heads are creeping her out. These horse heads make me hot. Dumpkin seems excited to hear this from Scott as he hides in the cabinet. The military insignia tattooed on Scott's arm indicate that he is a staff sergeant. Scott pulls out his wallet in search of a condom, which is where Richard noticed something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wasn't expecting you to lead the joke in that way. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a condom. Uh, it... Uh, the logo bears striking resemblance to the vintage video logo. Yeah, so we we have a branded wallet available uh, <laughs> for this for this movie only. It's almost as if we designed our logo to represent things that look like they're from the 80s. Yeah, <laughs> it is like that. When Scott doesn't find a condom, he leaves to collect a condom that he conveniently stored behind a toilet in the men's room. I got the idea from Godfather 1. <laughs> I'm just now making that connection. Yeah. I don't want my brother coming out of that toilet with just his dick in his hands, all right? Following the film's pattern, Scott leaves her alone, and the words big mistake blink on screen. Suddenly, the door is shaking violently, and when Patty realizes it isn't Scott, she pushes a shelf up against the door. When the breather breaks inside, Patty looks excited to see the person and assumes they're here to gift her the crown, which would seem to implicate one of a few people. Yeah. Like, we're shrinking the suspect audience here. When the killer gets too close, she screams, and from inside Dumpkin's cabinet, we hear war and industrial sound effects to imply a particularly gruesome death. Scott returns to the room and finds Patty's corpse wearing the crown upside down. Even though he has determined that she is dead, he is still horny. Mother of God and country, you're dead. Let's have one for old time's sake. Well, I won't be needing this. 
He ditches the condom, but then he hears noises across the room as another hefty bag approaches. Dumpkin hides terrified in his cabinet until a chainsaw cuts through the doors and he makes a run for it. He seems locked in the room and pleads with the killer for his life. Look, you've killed 10 people already. 11 is the legal limit in this state. He offers the killer his car to spare his life. Take my car. It's a gorgeous K car. I just washed it an hour ago. I buy Japanese. For some reason, the shop teacher keeps calling a chainsaw a buzzsaw, and he offers to teach the killer horsehead bookends. The killer chops off a wooden horse face with the chainsaw. Dumpkin tells the killer that chainsaws are for wood, not people, and then teaches the killer how to properly clean it. The killer knocks Dumpkin unconscious with some kind of a plastic case, and another title labels him as the 11th death and no longer a suspect. Toby gets into Principal Peter's office and uses the keys to start going through his desk. One drawer is just filled to the brim with marbles, and she drops them all over the floor. She moves to a filing cabinet, and we hear her fake boobs squeaking some more. The folders in here are labeled False Promises, Shit List, Ron Reagan, Hooker Domestic, Hooker Foreign, and Clues. Hardy heads to Henrietta Mumsley's office and goes through her things. Principal Peters realizes he has lost his keys and decides to check his office. The only paper in the clues cabinet says, look in the other cabinet. In the other cabinet, she finds headshots of every dead female student with synonyms for whore scribbled across their face. As she flips through them, Peters slips into the office behind her. Apparently, he recognizes her now as Toby and asks what she's doing here. She mentions what she found and how it seems to implicate him. As she talks through her logic facing the cabinet, he undresses behind her. When she finally turns back, he's standing there in boxers with I Heart New York stamped on his chest. Mr. Peters! You're naked! Yes, Toby. All these years I've been secretly naked underneath my clothes. But did anyone notice? Do you guys recall the last I Heart New York joke that we saw on the podcast? Can't stop the music? Nope. In the movie Stir Crazy, in the very beginning, a homeless person is digging through the trash and finds a shirt. But then when she opens it up, she sees that it's an I Heart New York shirt. And so she blows her nose in it and throws it back away. Oh. What, but it wasn't, what, I guess it wasn't a joke. Weren't they wearing I Heart New York? Weren't like the twins on roller skates wearing I Heart New York No, we were or in Los Angeles and the San Francisco girls were wearing San Francisco oh, shirts. okay. Fair enough. Well, we didn't do a, do you recall the last time uh, somebody was searching for uh, clues in filing cabinets? Oh, uh, I, I think phobia? I, yeah, for, phobia was one of them. Oh, no, that, that ended terribly. Yeah. Those were horrible murders. That's, uh, that's from my bloody Valentine. The other one was in a doctor's office. Phobia? That was also a doctor's <laughs> office. No, that was the... Was that the doctor's office? That was his... It was his home office, Yeah, because he, yeah, he invited the patient to his home, yeah. Um, a doctor's office where someone was going through a filing cabinet. It was nighttime. After hours? Mm-hmm. Uh, coast to coast? Nope. I was going to say, I w- was eyewitness? Was there... I don't, I don't remember. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of the howling. Um, oh, okay, yep. Yep, and then suddenly there's a werewolf standing on the filing cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> Principal Peters complains that he's had to watch all these beautiful girls turn into women and he couldn't do anything about it. Do you realize how that affects a man? Um, it makes you hot? That's right, Toby. It makes me hot. He says they were all caught having sex and Toby agrees that's disgusting. Out of nowhere, the principal leaves to find the only trophy the school has ever won in 20 years to show her. Ah, the the typing team really came through that year. Typing team? When she's alone in the office, she calls 911, but didn't consider their operating hours. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm in terrible danger, and, and, and I need some help. I, I need... I've reached the police. We are closed. But look out behind you. She tries the same trick on Peters when he returns with the trophy. He says he won't fall for it, and then he falls for it very quickly. He's like, I'm not going to fall for that, and he turns around real quick and checks behind him. The typing trophy is weirdly sharp, and Mr. Peters slips on it in his own marbles before stabbing himself through the chest. The title reads, The Trophy Retires the Principal, and the number 12 blanks. Toby throws a bag over his body. Outside, Toby can hear more of the faculty approaching. Mumsley and Malvert seem to be planning to kill her. Also outside are Dr. Sigmund and Sigmund's genetically mutated pets, but we never see them. 
Yeah. They just talk out there. I tamper with nature as a hobby. I crossed a flounder with a walrus and a horny toad. What did you get? A fish with warts and a mustache, but can't get a date. Peters leaps up from the floor and then dies again in a puddle of his own blood. Toby runs screaming to Mumsley's office and finds Hardy there dead with a dishwashing glove in his mouth. Now it's Mumsley's turn to monologue. Turns out she's been bagging up all the boys every time Peters kills a girl to help cover his tracks. I, I don't understand. Because he was my son. You're his mother? No, his father. Oh my god! Father hyphen mother. But Mumsley tries to bag her up, but as usual, once we've revealed the old lady is a killer, she can't seem to overpower any victims. Hold still while I kill you. I'm an old woman with arthritis. Weird disorienting carnival music plays as Toby runs around the school to escape. She encounters several characters that we've already seen die along the way. Mumsley chases her from inside of a trash can for some reason. I guess the bag she was holding evolved into a wastebasket. And she's yeah. just rolling down the hallway in it. Well, everything else that happens now is just like weird. Yeah weird imagery dr sigmund and duncan appear smiling dressed as a sailor and a woman in a dress respectively the principal appears in a strange flat hat with black balloons on all his fingers malvert and coors cowboy chase her down the hall she comes to a passage with hefty bags hanging from the ceiling the whole length of it that i found that actually a little disturbing the bags like yeah. I, I i found i found the hall the long hallway with all these bags just a little creepy yeah she finds a disembodied head hanging and then turns left to find Scott and his gun sitting in a stairwell. In another dead end, she finds Malvert's inflatable mistress hanging from a noose. More stairs have all the murder victims sitting in rows. I didn't hear it, but apparently there are several Godzilla roars mixed into the chaos of this scene. Eventually, the corpses chase her to the end of the hall and a bike cop points her to the window. This way out! <laughs> She jumps out the window and plummets several floors down before waking up in the hospital to a kiss from Hardy. Everyone is here with her, but they are mostly different from the characters we've come to know. The principal is now the janitor. Julie and Bertha are still alive, as are Patty and Scott, who are now homely and effeminate, respectively. The shop teacher, Mr. Dumpkin, is now wearing a beret. Oh, Monsieur Dumpshi, I had this dream, and, and you weren't even my French teacher. I would always be a French teacher. I really like that line. Like, she's for some reason going to fail his class over and over again, and he'll be her French teacher forever. She blames swine flu for this whole hallucination of a film. Mumsley, in a tan suit and fedora with a fake mustache, speaks dubbed in a man's voice. The doctor still seems to be a doctor. Luke, the paralyzed student, and Charles Ray, the blind kid, are now totally unhandicapped. So, Ray Charles, Charles Ray, that's the joke there. And Mr. Malvert, you were a janitor. Absurd. Patty and Scott inform Toby that she was voted prom queen during her coma, and everyone leaves her alone with Hardy, who seems the same. Yeah, boring, isn't it? Nope. Boring gets me hot. <laughs> we cut to them on a hike, and they stop to consider having sex because sexual repression is what caused her swine flu somehow. Hardy is disappointed by her interest in sex, and pulls on dishwasher gloves to strangle her with, and then we cut to her funeral. I think the funeral was originally planned to play before she woke up in the hospital, because Luke is in a wheelchair again, Charles is blind again, and Mumsley is a woman again. Dr. Sigmund eulogizes and diagnoses her simultaneously. She suffered severe social repression, countered by an expressed nausea toward sex, which led to severe social alienation, causing huge psychological problems, leading to the greatest psychological problem of them all, death. Hardy puts two flowers on her grave and apologizes for killing her. Suddenly, two arms burst out of the grave to strangle Hardy, and a title reads, The End. I was extremely disappointed that there was not a question mark after the end. Yeah. Or is it? Da, da, da. Yeah. Uh, this movie is weird because uh, it's really lazy writing. And it's it's definitely one of those, like, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. Um, but there are tiny little nuggets in there that make me laugh the whole way through it. I, I think that a movie like this is, like, because there were moments I laughed in Gorp. Right, yeah. Like, it, you just, you get so, like, worn out by it that when anything mildly funny happens, yeah. you, you just, the relief of just, like, okay. You got me. Uh, that's fine. I yeah. think I'm less tolerant than you guys. 
But this wasn't as irritating as Gorp, though. No, not nearly. But no. but there are parts where, like, especially anything with the breather talking is it's really hard to watch. Yeah. Because they're making it as aggressively unlistenable as they can. Like, that's the joke of the scene is that you don't want to hear this. But I don't want to hear that. Yeah. Uh, there, there were little funny bits here and there. And I basically have to give this movie points for two things. On, on top of the comedy, which, like I said, there's a few jokes in here that I think are really well-written jokes, and but I still understand why Michael Ritchie would want to take his name off of it. But Malvert is incredible. Yeah. Malvert yeah. is such an interesting character actor, and it's it's insane that he's not in more stuff. And then aside from that, the fact that this is the first slasher comedy. We're starting off a new genre, which will continue with films like Shriek or the um scary movie franchise obviously yeah. is the big one um but and i think we, we even get another like horror comedy movie later this year called saturday the 14th which is obviously being called yeah. saturday the 14th means it's it's a slasher parody because it's a friday the 13th parody but this one got there first it got to theaters first and i think it deserves some credit for that even if it's not that great a movie it at least won the race with bad form um I'm going to give this one a thumbs up, guys. Well, that's okay, because I'm giving it a down. Yeah, definitely a down. I Yeah. I was irritated by a lot of it, but I do have to give it a thumbs up because there's there's some fun stuff here. I know it's largely intolerable. But who are you going to tell to watch this movie? Horror fans. That's it. Even them. I yeah. don't know, man. What are we doing letterboxed? Richard, what are you thinking? Um, I don't have it as uh, probably as low as some, you guys might expect, but I have it at 84. Okay. Uh, which puts it below Savage Harvest, but above Tuck Everlasting. All right. <laughs> you have it higher than me. <laughs> uh, I have it at 102. Okay, out of what? 106? Out of 106. It is below Image of the Beast. Okay. And above Bushido Blade. I have it in 90th, which is just under Improper Channels and above The Four Seasons. I don't know how you could watch 90 movies that are better than this and still give it a thumbs up. I'm pretty sure I didn't give a thumbs up to the one above it on yeah. the list. What's wrong with you? Because this one has qualifications. It has a CV that counts for something in my book. All right. Even if I wouldn't watch this again right away. I'll watch it again eventually at some point. Oh, God. And you'll be sitting there with me. No, I won't. Our writer-director here was Mickey Rose. He has mostly comedy writing credits for television. Sid Caesar, Tim Conway, Dean Martin, The Odd Couple, Smothers Brothers, etc. But he also wrote Woody Allen's Bananas and What's Up Tiger Lily. He also had an uncredited contribution to Condor Man, released the same day in theaters. This has a very old-fashioned sensibility of comedy. Yeah. Rose also has 982 credits as a writer of Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, and his first credit was writing for the Sherry Lewis Show, birthplace of Lamb Chop. Obviously, we have an uncredited writing or directing credit for Michael Ritchie. He was a producer of the film who decided to take the name Alan Smithy in the credits. He also directed Prime Cut, The Candidate, The Bad News Bears, The Island, Divine Madness, and later Fletch, Golden Child, Fletch 2, and Cops and Robertsons. Our editor here was Ruth Hope. Just this and 1977's Starship Invasions. That's it. Kristen Ritter, or writer, played Toby. This is her only credit. Yeah, <laughs> when I when I casually browse the credits, when I'm like, Kristen Ritter's in this. Oh, yeah, that's great. No, different person. Yeah, uh, that's Jessica Jones. Yeah, the bee in Apartment Twenty Three. I also thought that Kristen Ritter or writer looks a lot like a grown up Millie Bobby Brown in places. There's just faces that she made yeah. where I was like, she looks really yeah. familiar. Matthew Goldsby played Hardy again, just this, and I feel like he's probably based on Radish from Final Exam, where he's like kind of this nerdy character who is trying to give her advice and she's mm -hmm. ignoring it and getting in trouble. Jerry Belson played the breather. Um, he's credited as Richard Brando, although Trade Papers credited the part to Richard Belzer. It didn't <laughs> sound like Richard Belzer to me. No, it did not. Um, but it's entirely possible it could be him or Jerry Belson. But Belson was an executive producer on the film. 
Belson also wrote 10 episodes of The Lucy Show, 18 episodes of The Dick Van Dyke Show. He created The Odd Couple and The Tracy Ullman Show and wrote Fun with Dick and Jane, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uncredited, Smokey and the Bandit 2, and Always, which I actually really love that movie. Yeah. Um, he also played Jerry in Modern Romance, but I couldn't figure out who that was. I think it's just somebody at that party that they go to, the house party. Joe Flood played Mr. Dumpkin. He's a U.S. police captain in A View to a Kill and a cop in Naked Gun 33 and a Third. Mimi Weddle played Miss Mumsley. She was Grandma Wellington in Hitch. That was her only other uh, big credit. Janice E. O'Malley played Nurse Crud. Uh, it's just this and Mrs. Clark in The Last Picture Show. Cullen G. Chambers played Charles Ray, the blind guy. He was Command Division Officer in Eleven Star Trek The Next Generations and Ocampa in Voyager. He was also sec def in Captain America Winter Soldier and a stand-in for Morgan Freeman in Brubaker and Seven and for Sam Jackson in Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown. Oscar James played the football coach. He was the shopkeeper in Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Jack Armstrong played Joe. This was his first feature. Later, he plays The Giver in The Giver, not to be confused with MacGyver. He's also Captain Comet in the live-action Patrick Warburton tick. Lauren Ritchie played a student, and I have to assume she is some relation of producer, uncredited writer-director Michael Ritchie. And The Stick is Malvert the Janitor. Also known as Patrick Boone Varnell, he was an extremely flexible, double-jointed comedian with only one other credit as Stick the Stagehand in the pilot of Nickelodeon series Out of Control with Dave Coulier. This guy is absolutely fascinating, and he's probably the best thing the film has going for it. Sadly, he passed away at 48 of a heart attack just eight years after this film was released. I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. What's that sound? We go! That's right, it's a new patron, and not just any patron. Justin Aylett is our first ever patron in the $100 tier. The job's gonna cost you 100 bucks, plus expenses. 100 bucks? That's ridiculous. So's the job. As such, he is entitled to a custom episode reviewing any pre-1980 title of his choosing. Justin has made a selection, which we're recording in just a moment, and it will be posting to our regular feed before the end of this month. On top of that, he now has access to 29 full-size 70s reviews and 34 minisodes from 1980. Thanks so much, Justin Aylett, for your generous contribution to the show. All right, all right, you got your hundred bucks. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Deadly Blessing, which IMDb describes like so. After her husband dies under mysterious circumstances, a widow becomes increasingly paranoid of the neighboring religious community that may have diabolical plans for her. We leave you now with a trailer for Deadly Blessing. In the rolling hills of eastern Pennsylvania, in this quiet community of simple farmers untouched by time, a gruesome secret has been protected for generations. Into this world come three young women, drawn by the beauty of the land, unaware of the mystery it holds. How could they have known that what they would discover would call forth a deadly blessing? Laws cannot crush the incubus. Ours can. There are three of us. We'll manage. We shall make it impossible for the incubus to rest comfortably in your soul. Ah! If thine hand offends thee, then in God's name, cut it off. Incubus has arrived. Those who will 
not believe. Those who will not be warned. May you be damned in hell. Those who will defy its power. Become its prey. It's him. The chilling story of terror and suspense. <laughs> Deadly blessing. Hi, I'm Jason the Terrible. I'm Slice and Dice and Dave. And I'm Grave Robert Jeff. And we are the Watch Out Horror Movie Review Podcast. Each episode, we bring you spoiler free reviews and recommendations for both recent films and horror classics. The granddaddy of all slasher movies. We start with three mini reviews from Jason the Terrible's DVD Dungeon. From Slice and Dice and Dave's Stream and Scream Sack of Nightmares. Don't forget Grave Robber Jeff's Fresh Dig. Jeff's review is the best this week. And then we move into our feature review, where we get into a much more detailed discussion. But fear not, we will not ruin the movie for you. We can't stand spoilers either. I hate them! They really grind my gears. Oh, for crow, okay. I'm plugging my ears. What I do want to know is how scary this movie might be, or how much gore there might be in it. We'll break the movie down over several categories so that you can decide if it's right for you. Jeff, what is that rate on the disturbo meter? Well, there's definitely some disturbing scenes in there. So if you're a horror fan who spends way too much time browsing through streaming services, or searching through that huge pile of DVDs in your basement, Tune in to watch out horror movie reviews every second Tuesday and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. But if horror movies aren't quite your thing, come and have a listen anyway. We have a lot of fun. That's watch out horror movie reviews. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go rob some graves. I love it. You can make that work, right? Watchouthorror.com.